live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. Before I go any further, I want to emphasize that the title is not completely accurate, because what happened on Sunday will always be number one. What Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver Antonio Brown did against the New York Jets was, without any shred of recency bias, the craziest instance of a player quitting I've ever seen. I don't know how else to describe it, and I'm not sure anyone does. I have no words. Everything that's been said about it has been said already, and I'm not sure we'll ever see anything like it again. Having said that, there have been plenty of instances of a player quitting, even if it wasn't in the middle of a game. You have Irving Fryer infamously leaving in the middle of a game after he got hurt, only to re-aggravate the injury by crashing into a tree on his drive back in the middle of the third quarter. You have Detroit Lions running back Joe Don Looney walking out in the middle of a game against the Atlanta Falcons, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. You have Denver Broncos tight end Riley Odoms quitting the team in the middle of training camp, only to return the next day as though nothing had happened. And then, you have whatever the heck this is. In 1965, a player on the Detroit Lions quit the team without ever realizing he quit, or without ever realizing that he was on the team. And this is the story behind one of the strangest moments of a player quitting, if you can even call it that, in NFL history. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand the player in question, as well as the situation he was dealing with on his team. Our main character in our story is this guy right here. This is Sonny Gibbs, and at the start of the 1960s, he might have been the best quarterback in the Southwest Conference. Gibbs played for TCU, and was their starting quarterback for three seasons. And not only was there improvement in all three years, but the improvement was fairly significant. His completion percentage rose every season, going from 42.3% in 1960, to 51.8% in 1961, to 52.7% in 1962. His passing yardage rose every season, going from 473 in 1960, to 999 in 1961, to 1013 in 1962. And the number of touchdown passes he threw rose every season, going from 3 in 1960, to 6 in 1961, to 9 in 1962. In every metric, Gibbs improved significantly on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, while these numbers might not seem too impressive by today's standards, back in the 1960s, these numbers made him one of the top quarterbacks in all of college football, and especially in the Southwest Conference. He finished second in the conference and passes completed in three straight years, and in 1962, his completion percentage of 52.7% was the second highest in the conference. He led the conference in passing yards in 1961, and followed that up with a second place finish in 1962. And on top of that, he was deadly with his legs. In 1962, he led the conference with seven rushing touchdowns, and led the conference by being responsible for 16 touchdowns when you combine his passing attack and his rushing attack. Not only was Gibbs one of the best quarterbacks in the conference, as he was a second-team All-Southwest Conference member in 1961, but at the time, he was one of the best quarterbacks in school history. And that's saying a lot, because this is the same school that had Sammy Baugh and Davey O'Brien in the 1930s. Yet, Gibbs was right up there with those guys from a statistical standpoint. Among quarterbacks to throw at least 100 passes in a season, Gibbs was one of just three, alongside Baugh and O'Brien, to complete at least 50% of his passes. And among quarterbacks to throw at least seven touchdown passes in multiple seasons, at the time, the list consisted of just Sammy Baugh and Sonny Gibbs. That was it. Even though TCU wasn't a really good team, Gibbs was a really good player. Unfortunately, his NFL career would not go quite as swimmingly. In 1962, both the Dallas Cowboys of the National Football League and the Denver Broncos of the American Football League decided to spend a draft pick on Gibbs, with the knowledge that he would be playing professionally in 1963 after finishing his career at TCU in 1962. And for Gibbs, the decision was pretty obvious as to where he was going to play. The Cowboys spent a second round pick on him, while the Broncos only spent a 14th round pick on him, so that meant more money. On top of that, Gibbs was born in Texas, went to high school in Texas, and went to college in Texas so it made sense that he was going to play professionally in Texas and join the Dallas Cowboys. However, his time with the Cowboys did not go well at all. He was never going to get any playing time, as he was well behind Eddie LeBaron and Don Meredith on the depth chart, and it was very clear that Meredith was the quarterback of the future, as he was putting up some pretty solid numbers. Even though Gibbs had the ideal height for the position, towering over everyone at 6'7", he was not going to see the field. And after just one year, the Cowboys cut their losses and got rid of him initially cutting him, and then trading him to the Detroit Lions for a fourth-round pick. The Lions needed a backup quarterback after Earl Morrill got injured with a broken collarbone, so the Lions thought that Gibbs could be a pretty solid insurance option. That didn't quite happen. This is the only footage of Gibbs as a Lion, which is never a good sign. He threw a grand total of three passes all season, 
going one for three with three yards, no touchdowns, and one interception, posting a passer rating during the 1964 season of 2.8, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. It was not a good season for Gibbs whatsoever. And to make matters worse, in 1965, the Lions got a brand new head coach, as George Wilson, the man who won at Gibbs, was replaced with Harry Gilmer, the former defensive backs coach of the Minnesota Vikings. And once Gilmer became the head coach, Gibbs' climb to make the roster, let alone make an impact, was about to get even steeper. Back in 1965, most teams carried two quarterbacks on their roster. You rarely, if ever, saw teams carry three quarterbacks, as a third quarterback was seen as a waste of a roster spot. This meant that if Sonny Gibbs was going to make it onto the roster in 1965 and make it onto Gilmer's first ever Lions team, that he was going to have to beat out one of two guys in front of him. And that was looking increasingly unlikely when looking at just who was ahead of him on the depth chart. The projected starting quarterback for the Lions in 1965 was a man by the name of Milt Plum. He was the starting quarterback on the Lions the previous year, and had been a starter in the league for more than half a decade at this point. Perhaps he is best known for his seasons with the Cleveland Browns from 1959 to 61, where he led the league in completion percentage all three years. He made it to two Pro Bowls in Cleveland, and the year before in 1964 with the Lions, finished sixth in passing touchdowns, sixth in completion percentage, seventh in passing yards, seventh in passer rating, and fourth in yards per pass attempt. In other words, Plum was going to be the starter for 1965, and there was little if any chance that Gibbs could beat him out. And then there was this guy right here. This is Tom Myers. Why he was drafted by the Lions, seeing as in his final year at Northwestern in 1964, he threw two touchdowns and 11 interceptions, and finished dead last amongst all starting quarterbacks in the Big Ten in passing touchdowns, I'm not entirely sure. But the Lions did, and they spent a fourth round pick on him. For whatever reason, head coach Harry Gilmer was really high on Myers. It was unlikely that Gibbs was going to be out a high draft pick and overtake his spot on the depth chart. Combined with the fact that the Lions drafted two other quarterbacks that year, although they were drafted in the 18th and 20th rounds respectively, and the odds that Gibbs made the roster were slim to none. And that's where things are about to get weird. And I truly mean it. It's going to be really weird. On Wednesday, August 11th, 1965, the Lions met with Gibbs, and Gilmer was incredibly blunt with him. Gilmer told Gibbs that his odds of making the team were slim, and that the team was going to try and get rid of him. In other words, the Lions had no place for Gibbs. Thanks for coming out, but you're not making the team. Naturally, when a coach holds a meeting with you and tells you straight up that you're not going to be on the team, and that you're not going to be here anymore, you think to yourself that you're not going to be there anymore. You think that's the end of the road, as any reasonable person would. And with that, Gibbs never showed up to a Lions practice or camp or training session ever again. But on Thursday, August 12th, there was a man that was absolutely furious about this and was fuming about the way he was treated. That man? It was not Sonny Gibbs. Rather, amazingly enough, it was Harry Gilmer. Gilmer lashed out at Gibbs for not being there in practice and for quitting on the team and said that he expected Gibbs to continue working out with the Lions and was furious that he wasn't. Now, if you're a reasonable person, you're probably thinking to yourself, hey, wait a second, you just cut Gibbs. You just told him he's not going to be on the team. You just told him the night before that he had no place in Detroit. And now you're saying that he quit on the Lions? You actually expected a player who you told was not going to be on the team, and who assumed like any normal person would that this meant that they did not have a job anymore, to show up to work? Are you crazy? We never got to hear Gibbs' side of the story or his reaction to this. But just think about how crazy this scenario sounds in a non-football context. If your boss calls you in and tells you straight up, we're dealing with budget cuts, so we're going to let you go or your performance isn't quite what we were hoping for, so we're going to fire you. Would you still show up to work the next day? Of course not! The boss fired you! You no longer work there! No boss worth anything would think after that conversation that you quit! That's not how it works. And yet, you have Harry Gilmer telling Sonny Gibbs that he's a quitter and that he should have been at practice and should have been with the team, and you have Sonny Gibbs thinking to himself, what are you talking about, you crazy first-year head coach who has no idea what he's doing? You let me go! You fired me! I'm not sure it gets a whole lot stranger than that. At least with Antonio Brown or Vontae Davis or someone like that, it's obvious that they quit. There was no hidden meaning. It was not subtle. There was no ambiguity as to what happened. This, on the other hand, I mean, my God, that's absurd. And unfortunately, and perhaps unsurprisingly, neither side had a happy ending from this. Let's start with Sonny Gibbs. He was cut by the Lions to the shock of absolutely no one with a brain and never played in the NFL again. Yes, his production when he was in the league was pretty underwhelming, especially for a second-round pick. But I'm not sure how many teams just decided to stay away from him and to not touch him with a 39-and-a-half-foot pole after hearing the news that he walked out of camp. 
even though I can't blame him for walking out of camp after being told that he wasn't going to be on the team. Gibbs bounced around a few semi-pro football teams in the Continental League, but was out of football entirely after the 1967 season. After what he did at TCU, and after the hype surrounding him in his 6'7 frame, his career had to be somewhat of a disappointment. As for Harry Gilmer, considering the whole fiasco where he genuinely expected a player that he cut to show up to practice the next day, I don't think I'm going to blow anyone's mind when I say that he did not pan out as an NFL head coach. Shocker, I know. He was completely in over his head, and only lasted two seasons with Detroit, and a stint so disastrous that by the end of it, fans were pelting him with snowballs. The Lions went 6-7-1 in 1965 and 4-9-1 in 1966, winning just 10 games out of 28 and finishing 6th in their division both years. Gilmer was a fantastic college player and is in the College Football Hall of Fame for a reason, as he is an Alabama legend. But as a coach? Yeah, not so much. It's been close to 60 years since these events happened. I'm not sure anything has topped this in terms of absurdity. So I guess if there are any general managers or front office personnel or bosses or upper management people watching this, here's the takeaway from this video. If you're going to cut a player or fire someone, make it very obvious that you're doing this action. If you go down this path, please be reasonable and don't expect that person to show up to work when you literally fire them and let them go. To expect that out of someone is mind-bogglingly stupid. I genuinely don't know what Harry Gilmer was thinking when he did this. Sonny Gibbs probably holds the distinction of being the only player in NFL history to quit his team without realizing that they were on the team in the first place. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed out to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel, your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.